thousand nations of the Persian Empire descend upon you. Our arrows will blot out the sun. Then we will fight in the shade. This is where we fight! This is where they die! Before this battle is over, the world will know that few stood against many. This is the first lesson on Topic 6 Chemical Kinetics, 6.1 Collision Theory and Reaction Rates. And these are the objectives for the lesson. So as you just saw on the movie that Hollywood made about chemistry, called 300, you can see that the collision theory is based on three principles. First of all, the particles must collide, so they must come to contact with each other. Number two, they must collide with sufficient energy. We call that the activation energy. And so we can also call that kinetic energy. And then they must collide in the right orientation. So if you're looking for a molecule that looks like this, uh, it may be that they need to collide in this in with each other here and not over with this other atom. So we call that the correct 3D geometrical alignment or orientation and that's also called the steric factor. So we use an enthalpy diagram here and this it's important to make sure you know what's on the on the axes. So this is potential energy and this is the reaction progression. And what we have here is this amount of energy is needed in order to initially break the bonds and form the products. Now this doesn't matter if it's going towards this direction, which is exothermic, or whether it's going the other direction, which is endothermic, except for if you're going for the endothermic, the activation energy will be uh, a lot higher. So how do you lower this activation energy? Well, the main ways to lower this activation energy are using a catalyst, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and increasing the temperature. And the main ways to increase the collision rate, which increases the rate as well, increasing the concentration or pressure, which is the same, uh, similar thing in this case for the collision theory, or increasing the surface area. So first of all, increasing the concentration by increasing, say, the number of arrows hitting the Spartans, or increasing the number of Spartans as well, the likelihood of the arrow hitting the spot and the likelihood of these hitting each other increases because there is an increased number of collisions and there is a, num a higher chance that those because there's an increased number of collisions there's an increased number of chance uh, increasing chance that they will have enough energy when they do collide and when because there's more collisions that they'll be in the right 3D orientation so well, you need to use this collision theory, these three points, when you're explaining any of these factors. So the next thing is the surface area. Uh, so the Spartans would would gather around here and protect themselves and decrease the surface area. Uh, and they eventually got defeated by coming in behind and breaking up one of these uh, defences, I think. Uh, so what it is here is it increases the surface area. What does the increased surface area do? Uh, it means there's more area for them to collide. Uh, and again, you need to just always add these little things in there. If there's more area of collide, then there's more collisions. And if there's more collisions, the chance of there being a correct one with colliding with enough energy will increase as well as the, not the right 3D orientation. Okay, but the main point is number one, but don't forget two and three as consequences of that, of increased collisions. Now, temperature is the most obvious one. Uh, and why is that? Well, if you increase the temperature, the particles move faster. Uh, and so they're going to, if they move faster, they're going to collide into more things. Uh, this is far more significant here for the energy, though, because if there's more temperature, if there's an increase in kinetic energy of the particles, which is what temperature is, the average kinetic energy, uh, then of course there's going to be far more uh, co collisions with enough energy to succeed. Uh, and don't forget, of course, there's going to be 
more chances of there being a correct 3D orientation collision because there is more collisions. So it's important to be able to draw those factors in there. Now the Maxwell-Boltzmann diagram is one you're expected to draw. You'll see here again they often ask you to use name the axes. So remember this is number of particles and this is kinetic energy of the particles. So if you have uh, something at zero degrees, it will look like this. And if you increase the temperature to 100 degrees, you're still going to have some particles at zero degrees. This is zero here. Uh, but what you're going to have is a greater number of particles with more kinetic energy, because the average kinetic energy is, has increased. And if this is the activation energy here, then you will have here for 100 degrees, which is in the yellow, slightly more, well I can include the 25 as well, uh, more particles that will have more activation energy than the situation if it's a zero degrees. There will only be a small number of particles uh, that will have enough kinetic energy to react. Catalysts. Now catalysts overcome activation energy by lining up molecules in an unusual way in order for them to react. The catalyst is very much like your hand. They arrange these metal pieces, these molecules, in, in an unusual way, sort of unnatural if you like, uh, which allows the reactions to occur much, which allows the reactions to occur much faster than they would normally. Again, it's, it's very important that you can draw the, the Maxwell-Boltzmann curves for these. So number of molecules here, uh, kinetic energy is, is, is slightly better to say what type of energy it is, it's moving energy. And so what a catalyst will do, well, it'll push down the, amount, the, the activation energy needed for it to react. So you get all of these extra particles here with less kinetic energy that can now react. So that's how it speeds up the reaction. Enthalpy level diagrams are also what you need to be able to draw. So what you can do here is you just draw a smaller curve here to represent the smaller activation energy with a catalyst. Moving on to rates of reaction now. Now you can write this as a decrease in reactants or an increase in products. Generally we just don't worry about the negative there. And that's per time. So this remember the units for that. Concentration, that's moles per litre uh, per second. Now you should be in class doing a, a whole range of different experiments. So you'll need to plan these. So the things that you can change are things we've talked about. Surface area, concentration, temperature and catalyst. Choose one of those and you can then, once you've chosen that, you can then think about uh, what sort of chemicals you want to use and make sure that they're safe and whether it's more appropriate to measure the, the change in products or change in reactants. Now the way you can measure it, these are the most common ones, so have a look at these first. Uh, is there a change in gas or pressure, change in mass, change in colour, change in pH or change in conductivity? Highly recommended if you're going to get your range of 5 and repetition of 3. Uh, use your data loggers to get accurate and quick information. So some other things to think of. If you're using uh, gas collection and the gas is lighter than air, you may want to set it up like hydrogen. You may want to set it up in this sort of format. Notice here we're trying to control the temperature with a water bath and notice here that we're actually measuring it. So we're not controlling anything unless we're measuring it. So don't say you've controlled temperature just because you put ice in there. Uh, you need to check that it is being controlled and how controlled it is and that goes for all your experiments. Now when do you collect gas over water? You must make sure it is not soluble. Uh, so ammonia, ammonia gas would not be acceptable because it's highly soluble in water. Notice also this apparatus here helps us release chemicals into here without losing stuff out the side if you're putting this, the, uh, the bung back in. Now this one here is okay for carbon dioxide because that's a relatively uh, heavy gas so you can measure the change in weight. Notice that's heavier than air so there may be some residual stuff stuck in there. It may not all come out that well. Uh, you certainly don't try it for hydrogen because it's too light and your the accuracy of your machine won't be enough. The errors will be too large. Spectrophotometry is a nice one to do because it will measure the change in colour far more accurately than you can. So try using a colorimeter or a spectrophotometer if you've got changes in colour going on, or even a formation of a precipitate. That's much better than using the clock reaction where you can see the X disappear because of the increase in precipitate. 
change in pH as the reaction occurs you may get a change in pH so you can either do an acid base titration which isn't ideal because that's more of a, a an end point a finished reaction you can't really get the rate uh, so that uh, that has some limits you have to be careful change in conductivity may help but that also has problems as well with other reactions have a careful think about those what you really want to do with all of these things is measure the reaction over time so you need to be taking constant readings rather than just one final reading the reason for that is I'll explain uh, very soon is if you just take one reading you're only going to be able to take an average rate and what you really want to take is an inst instantaneous rate uh, at the initial reading so an initial rate and here as I mentioned before a clock reaction uh, this is when you can tell when a reaction has reached a certain point so again that's very limited because you can't take a whole range of values so getting on to the finer details now, you need to be able to measure the rate of the reaction. So the, you need to take measurements, some sort of measurements here over time. And to do that, you take delta y and delta x. So once you get the y equals mx plus c, uh, this here, the m is the gradient, delta y, delta x, and c is the intercept. So last thing here, and I'll show you the calculations for this. You don't want to get the initial, the average rate. Why don't you want to get the average rate? because as the reaction progresses you're getting a decrease in concentration so you're not controlling your variables and most likely it's an exothermic, it may be endothermic it doesn't matter, you're getting a change in temperature so you're not controlling your concentration or temperature over the time with the average rate so you, as you'd expect with a decrease in concentration uh, usually, not usually with a massive increase in temperature that could be the same uh, often your rate is actually less than what it should be because it starts to slow down as you can see this curve here. So average rate, not good. Uh, what you want to do is instantaneous rate at a point in time, but you don't want to do it too far into the reaction. You want to do it just as the reaction starts, when you know exactly what the concentration is and exactly what the temperature is. So you can say that you've measured both and you've controlled both. That's your initial rate and that's the one that you want. So how do we do that? I've taken somebody's values here uh, they've got a change over time and so I've graphed that here and you can see we have a curve here that you'd expect for these rate of reactions so the first thing you do most likely your program won't allow you to so you have to manually draw a line in there uh, that's why it's extremely important you have enough grid lines so that you can read it off so choose a point where that nicely intersects an x and a y point so you can read it off more accurately and then the you can write the rate, so you get the delta y and the delta x and in this particular case it's 104.2 and that's parts per millions per second I'm going to do the uncertainties on these so because you're dividing here uh, you have to add the percent uncertainties and that gives me a 1% error so I take 1% of 1.04 and that gives me 1 part per million so I take everything up to these the number of decimal places of the uncertainty and so my final answer will be 104 plus or minus one part per million per second.